Although it may not seem like it now, the city of Stevens Point was founded upon the lucrative financial success of the lumber industry. Starting as no more than a landing point between the turbulent waters to the north and to the south, this smooth patch of water proved to be geographically advantageous as the lumber industry expanded. As the lumber industry expanded, the tiny pioneer village of Stevens Point expanded with it, growing with the railroad into the city we know and love today. In 1836, two years after the Menominee Treaty, George Stevens traveled the Wisconsin River looking for opportunities to stake his claim in the growing lumber industry. After braving the rapids that were characteristic of the region at that time, Stevens selected the area of Calm River to serve as a stopping off point during his travels and training journeys. Soon after, he bought a cabin belonging to James Allen. Though Stevens held no personal or permanent connection to this area, his name would be adopted to the city that was eventually established. Born in 1790 in New York State, most of what we know about George Stevens' life is a still a mystery, as is most of the pioneers of that time that came to Wisconsin for its abundant natural resources. However, from what we do know, we know that George Stevens was a wealthy lumbersman from Allegheny County in New York State. George Stevens married Lucy Corey on July 8, 1813, in the town of Ullman, New York, where he remained until 1844. According to the bibliographical sketch prepared by S.A. Sherman, George and Lucy were the parents of two sons, Chester D. and George C., as well as six daughters, Pamela, Serena, Sophronia, Elizabeth, Lucy Jane, and Mary C. According to varying sources, the Stevens family moved from Almond to Belvedere, Illinois. The exact date is disputed. However, between 1837 and 38, Stevens met fellow lumberman Robert Wakeley in St. Louis wherein he was regaled with a story of the great pine forests and powerful water of the upper Wisconsin River. Initially skeptical of this story, Stevens traveled north with Wakeley and was greatly impressed with the magnificent Wisconsin pineries. Moving past, Stevens continued over to Big Bull Falls, wherein he chose available land before returning home to dispose of his business interests. To understand the conditions that Stevens was contending against, an account was created to celebrate the 1958th centennial of Stevens Point, which details the river route that was taken. For a distance of 60 miles below the spot where Stevens had launched his dugout canoe, Shorette, Conan's, Byron's, Grinion's, and Whitney's Rapids whipped the water into whirlpools and foam. Again, Stevens' personal details are cloudy, but what is known is that he left New York with little wealth and moved west to find new opportunities. With him came John Fox, a millwright by trade, and with a team of oxen, they plowed into Wisconsin by way of Fort Winnebago and Point Bowes, and eventually arrived at what is now Stevens Point. At this point, Stevens and his band of pioneers loaded a part of their supplies into canoes, placed the rest in an improvised storehouse, and started upstream. Returning to this point, Stevens later enlarged his storehouse and then opened a trading post which served the lumbermen of the region. It was around this post that Stevens Point grew. After again trekking upriver with his team, Stevens made his claim at what is now Wausau and built the first lumber mill at a point on the east bank of the river. By 1840, Stevens had his mill in operation, and in 1841, he ran the first lumber down to St. Louis and continued until 1851. What happened to him after that point is again a mystery, as his lumber business proved unsuccessful. This was the case with many in the same line of work, primarily because of the high cost incurred whilst moving, the sluggish speed of production, the great distance from market, and the great expenses incurred in losses and damages sustained in running lumber on the river. Stevens died a poor man in 1866, never returning to the town that would bear his name. Before the establishment of Stevens Point, however, the industry of lumber which drew him and countless others to the northern regions of Wisconsin originated before Stevens arrived in 1839. In 1832, Daniel Whitney and Amable Grinion were authorized by the Menominee tribe to build sawmills along the river. To supply these mills, Whitney pulled together a team of wagons and blazed the Pinery Trail from Portage to Nakusa, thus opening the way for additional settlers to travel to this area. Whitney would run his first route of lumber from northern Wisconsin the next year. In 1836, the Menominee tribe signed the Lumberman's Treaty, allowing logging and sawmilling in a three-mile wide strip along the banks of the Wisconsin River, upstream from Nakusa to Wausau. Further expanding the lumber industry in the area around Stevens Point would soon take shape 
thus opening the door for those like Stevens who were looking for new economic opportunities. From this point, various sawmills began popping up along the river, with Gilbert Conant and Daniel Campbell building a dam and a sawmill at Conant's Rapids. A sawmill under the management of James Harper and Robert Bloomer being constructed at the Jordan Settlement in 1839, George Stevens' sawmill being built at Wausau in 1840, and Moses' strong sawmill being built at Conant's Rapids in 1848. By 1853, a total of 14 sawmills were operating in the vicinity of Stevens Point, and around them, there began the rudimentary formation of the town itself. Between 1841 and 1858, further construction of industry took place in and around Stevens Point proper, in the form of housing, stores, saloons, brothels, farms, and public institutions, so as to accommodate the inflow of migration. One such interesting addition was the construction and launch of the side wheel steamer, the Northerner. It was to transport people and supplies to Stevens Point, and there was also the noteworthy construction of St. Stephen's Catholic Church in 1855. At the same time period, the importance of the public square became fully realized with the community coming to sell their wares and produce, giving rise to the photos of a square packed with a multitude of people and animals. The material sold in the square was often milk, eggs, home churned butter, livestock on the hoof were slaughtered, grains, hides, fur, wool, potatoes and other vegetables in season, orchard fruits and berries, wild honey, maple syrup, firewood, and hay. Regardless of the popularity that the square brought to the city, it was justifiably considered the devil's elbow as a result of its reputation as a place of alcoholic debauchery and prostitution. It was not uncommon that the full pay of a person could be spent in one single night. This would further cement the image of Stevens Point as a rough pinery town, similar in many ways to the popular memory of what a Wild West Territory town looked like. By 1857, the total population of Stevens Point had approached 2,000, and so the next year, a volunteer firefighter group organized a hook and ladder brigade to combat the fires that were a common occurrence in a town comprised of solely wooden buildings and few fire safety regulations. In the following years, the city would enlarge as a result of its lumber industry, eventually forming the first teacher's institute at the White School in 1860, constructing a bridge to span the Wisconsin River in 1867, and later an iron highway bridge in 1877. During this period, the city would also expand its communication options. In 1870, E.B. Winthrop would print the first edition of the Stevens Point Journal. In 1873, the Western Union Telegraph Company opened the sender's receiver's office, and in 1879, the county's first telephone line was strung from Cadmus Drugstore on Main Street to the Wisconsin Central Freight Depot. This allowed the city to connect to the burgeoning railroad network, effectively allowing the local lumber industry access to the wider market across the United States. Stevens Point would continue to be a growing population, with the metropolitan area numbering approximately 4,445 people by 1880. The city would respond to this growth with the installment of numerous public works, which would consist of a street sign and a house numbering system in 1881, the first public telephone service in 1882. In 1883, they would hire a chief of law enforcement for the newly appointed police force, which would come to replace the antiquated form of martial law. In 1884, the city would commission Henry and Thomas Higgins to establish a gaslight plant, and finally, Stevens Point would construct the public waterworks plant to supply drinking and firefighting water in 1880. What can be ultimately gathered from these developments is that as lumber took the sole prominence as the main source of community revenue, the city and population inhabiting it needed to have a more structured system of operation, communication, and public infrastructure. This makes sense that considering by the 1890s, the approximate population of Stevens Point was 7,896 people. When the first people to make their economic living from the land's natural resources came to this area, they were attracted by the large stand of white pines. At that time, the lumbermen began to establish more and more sawmills along the banks of the Wisconsin River. The first was established in 1837 on the west bank by Gilbert Conant, the second by Daniel Campbell at Shore at Rapids, and another was to be established by Azon Richardson, on the east bank of Stevens Point that same year. Two years later, another two mills began operation on Mill Creek and on the Plover River, with the latter being dammed up for Jordan Pond. In 
In the following decades, other mills would be built around the Stevens Point area. Specifically, at least six mills were built on the Wisconsin, with others being constructed in the immediate vicinity, primarily producing shingles and boarding at this stage. By the 1850s, cooperative efforts were undertaken to govern the vast logging industry, known as the Wisconsin River Improvement and Lumber Protection Company. Between the 1850s and the 1890s, the lumber industry would run as an economic powerhouse in the area. However, its ecological impacts were not far behind. By the early 1890s, the vast logging operations in the old growth pine forests of northern Wisconsin had been severely depleted. This depletion meant that lumber lost its preeminent status in the community's economy. This focus would shift to the more domestic production of paper, which would subsequently replace the sawmills along the river with paper mills. Gone too would be the familiar image of vast log jams that would span the river's length, with the last drive of logs to the McDill Dam taking place in 1889. During the early 1850s, the railroad would serve as a way to connect the markets of Stevens Point to larger markets across the United States. So the railroad would be built along the logging lines that they would use to easily get the logs to the production centers along the river. So these small locomotives would serve a crucial, crucial role in the growth and development of Stevens Point itself. Once the logging industry had made Stevens Point an established population center, and had begun to give way to the papermaking industry, the railroad would also adapt as Stevens Point would transition from a territorial town into a bona fide city with a more urbanized population. In many ways, the railroad became a rebirth for Stevens Point, and because of its vicinity to the sawmills, the railroad would keep the lumber industry alive long after the river driving had ended. In the city of Stevens Point proper, the railroad became an economic focal point for many people because of the ability to connect them to the outside world with locomotives bringing in loads of fresh fruit, seafood, cloth, coal, steel, and many other products. It would also serve as a cost-effective and efficient means to transport lumber, paper products, and finished furnitures to markets across the nation. Attesting to this central importance is the construction of the city itself, with Division Street, Elk Street, Water Street, and Strong's Avenue all leading to the Wisconsin Central and Sioux Line depots. Because of the sheer number of railroad depots, and the sheer number of people and goods that arrived through them, the south side of Stevens Point became a prosperous section of the city with its many restaurants, taverns, hotels, boarding houses, and brothels serving the traveling public, which would eventually define the city in its early years. Many of these businesses were owned and operated by people associated with the railroad, which further tied the community to their new economic inlet. However, the initial construction of the railroad was not a definite promise, because between 1870 and 1871, it was a process for many of hanging on the word of every telegraph message that arrived in, sometimes saying that the railroad was coming, and sometimes it was not, sometimes saying that its arrival would be imminent, and then the construction would be delayed, either for a short period of time or indefinitely. When the track was finally laid down and the first locomotive arrived in the station, there was immense celebration as the economy and importance of Stevens Point and Portage County would be henceforth transformed forever. People would go so far as to say that Stevens Point should replace Madison as a state capital because of its location and its connection to the state as a railroad junction. According to an extensive account made by Portage County of Place and Time, the first railroad line to be built through the Stevens Point area was under the Milwaukee, Oregon, Wapaka, Berlin, Stevens Point line which made additional runs through the rural towns of Belmont, Almond, Pine Grove, and Plover, which allowed farmers to buy stock in the railroad. Unfortunately, rampant speculation on the part of the railroad company in 1857 meant that the line was never fully completed and that farmers lost large amounts of money in the process. Between 1857 and 1851, the community would sit in rocky limbo and uncertainty until the first train came into Stevens Point from Menasha in 1871, later be extended to reach Marshfield the following year. In 1873, the Wisconsin Valley Railroad Company arrived in Junction City from Toma and would be extended later to Wausau. In 1875, the Wisconsin Central Railroad began operations at its Portage branch, first from Stevens Point to Hancock and later to Portage City and Madison. As was characteristic of many Midwest towns with connections to the railroad, many modes of transportation, stagecoach and steamboat in particular, 
became obsolete and ultimately ceased operations because of their inability to compete. However, for the many jobs lost to technological evolution, the community of Stevens Point and Portage County received a significant boost with the added revenue influx. After the 1870s, the success of the railroad caused carriage-based transportation to become of secondary importance. The construction and an extension of highways began to undergo what local experts refer to as a dark ages until approximately 1900. In the meantime, the importance of the railroad reached a further extension as large repair shops were erected around 1875 to see to the maintenance of these locomotives of the Wisconsin Central and Wisconsin Valley Railroad companies. For the next 30 years, these workshops would be the most important single industry in the city. By 1900, the city's economy was reaping the rewards of its position in the center of the timber industry and as an important railroad junction. However, that would change when the shops and division point of the Wisconsin Central Railroad moved to Fond du Lac and Abbotsford, ultimately making the Stevens Point Railroad shops unnecessary. For the next 10 years, the city's condition on the south side was characterized by vacant housing and a markedly slim payroll for the remaining railroad workers. By 1909, a new opportunity would arrive when the Sioux Line leased the existing railroad and essentially made Stevens Point its new division point, bringing revenue back to the community. When the Telegraph Lines read these words in 1893, the city of Stevens Point was undergoing the economic difficulties of a place in transition as lumber was beginning to give way to paper mills. With the community concerned about the economic future of their homes, the word that the Board of Regents who was looking for a possible location for the next normal school was a possible godsend if their location was chosen. Prior to 1893, the normal school system had become secondary whilst the United States government was engaged in the Civil War. But, following the war, the Board of Regents began reinstating the establishment of teaching schools for the purpose of providing teachers to educate the increasing population. Stevens Point was no exception. With its increased population, the announcement of the normal schools in the area signified a change from resource extraction to more domestic and educational focuses. The relationship of the construction of the normal schools versus the increase in population is shown by the establishment of five normal schools between 1866 and 1890, namely existing only in the southern portion of the state, leaving the central and northern areas of Wisconsin completely unrepresented and unprovided for, though they accounted for one-third of the total state population. With the population and total railroad mileage and state valuation considered, the Board of Regents were directed by the state legislature to find a suitable location with nearness and the ease with which it can be reached by potential students. The recommendation was pushed forward by John Phillips, the first member of the normal Board of Regents from Stevens Point. He had long sought to make the city the location of the sixth normal school. However, this would prove problematic as Phillips' recommendations came into conflict with the legislative bill passed by Neil Brown, a Wassa native, which required that the new school must be located north of the 24th Township, thus eliminating Stevens Point as a viable option. Upon hearing this, the people of Stevens Point raised considerable protest at the standards within the bill. Shortly after, a committee of representative citizens from Stevens Point appeared before the legislature to oppose this exclusion. Upon hearing the committee, Brown proposed an amended version of the bill, eliminated the disputed boundary clause, and further provided the resources for two additional normal schools to be constructed in the northern part of the state. He also provided for a donation to the state of a suitable site with the sum of at least 15000 before a school could be established. When this word came out to the region, competition for the sites became a sticking point for various communities. Many cities entered the race for the prize, including Fort Howard, De Pere, West De Pere, Grand Rapids, Centralia, Marshfield, Merrill, Nielsville, Chippewa Falls, Eau Claire, La Crosse, Sparta, Toma, Ashland, Washburn, Bayfield, Superior, and among others. With Stevens Point and Wassa added to this mixture, there began an undeclared but spirited contest for dominance. In fact, this verbal jousting was not just a symptom of the immediate want for a normal school between the two cities. It had been occurring regularly since the 1870s, only increasing as it became evident that the state needed more normal schools, one perhaps to serve the northern part of the state, 
and another to serve the central section. The jousting went so far as to take the form of a public relations campaign between the two cities to bolster their image to the State Board of Regions to make them more applicable. With the City Council of Wassa and the Wassa Pilot pronouncing that if any other city wanted the school, it would have to hustle to get it, as Wassa was playing hard for first place. It further stated that other towns had better keep a watchful eye on the city of Wassa because it clearly outranks many of them in natural beauty of locations and in advanced municipal improvements. Stevens Point's efforts, for their part, were based on their prior economy and their economic concerns about generating revenue for the city, all of which generated large amounts of excitement amongst members of the community. The Stevens Point Journal would declare that the city wants that school and it wants it bad, admonishing the residents of the community to consider themselves a committee of one to do all he can to secure it. When the city council met in 1893, the council discussed the merits of the presence of a normal school in its community, advocating that such a school would not be a burden to the taxpayers of the city and would provide the children of the area a chance for further education regardless of the wealth and ability of their parents to pay. Between 1893 and 1894, there were a series of proposals and counter-proposals between their respective cities until the two remaining sites of Wassa and Stevens Point were the only two remaining applicable options. When Stevens Point was finally chosen, it was in no small part a result of the railroad's influence on the city's accessibility, which acclaimed the thrift, prosperity, and growth that met them on every hand. When the news reached the community, celebration was to follow shortly behind, where an approximately 2,000 people had gathered to receive the final word, and jubilation exploded from the ever-growing crowd. Soon, it was the estimate that three to 5,000 people filled the streets in a joyous mood, with huge bonfires erupting in the public square, and local bands answered the call to assemble. A great racket was also reported, with people blowing horns, banging drums, and pounding pieces of wood together. City leaders would also make short congratulatory speeches. With the schools secured, Stevens Point had still to address the loss that Wassa sustained as a result. According to the Stevens Point Journal, this celebration was not to be at the expense of Wassa or because of the material benefits to be gained, but rather, the celebration was to recognize that to which way were by right entitled one of the highest educational institutions of the state, an institution whose broad steps will lead up to doors that swing outward to the rich and poor alike. With this addition to the city, there began a new chapter for Stevens Point as its focus became one of the ever-increasing importance on the normal school and later the university as its defining aspect. The presence of the normal school also improved the economic outlook to the city as added public attention and revenue would support the community and its burgeoning papermaking industry to the present day, gaining Stevens Point a reputation as the premier school on natural resource studies, education, and the humanities. The story of Stevens Point is a story of the evolution of a community from resource extraction to higher education. Through this evolution, we see that the lumber industry and the railroad played, and in some ways, continue to play a key defining role, with the lumber industry creating a viable center of economic opportunity in the region for many people, which would later be boosted by the construction of the sawmill industry, which created a more permanent settlement for people to grow around. With the introduction of the railroads, the city of Stevens Point and its main export was connected to the national markets in a more efficient nature, and it helped to increase the population of the city with greater connectivity as a railroad junction. Humble beginnings would prove successful for Stevens Point, with lumber and the railroads providing a necessary platform to build the city into what we see today. Without this foundation, Stevens Point could have had a very different destination, not unlike a train without tracks. Further prestige and innovation would evolve the city into one of higher education, fresh entrepreneurial enterprises, and new technologies and services. Today it is the economic and educational center of Portage County, with many making it their families' homes due to the many opportunities available. In the future, the city will unveil its next evolution in its history, chugging along the tracks of time. <laughs>